On this episode of Indefectible, honoring the men and women who had the courage to stand up for truth and lay the foundation for future generations of Catholics. And I'll never forget the day uh, this priest gave a very liberal sermon. And right in the middle of the sermon, my father snapped his finger and said, we all got up, genuflected, and walked out. And uh, I'll never forget that because the, the church was packed and we were up in the front. Zealand and I always tell people the south of the North Island mm -hmm. so it's where we were raised and uh, the little town called Paraparam or if you say it in the Maori language it's Paraparamu which in school we had to learn both languages so <clears throat> that was kind of an interesting, interesting. growing up there um, but I have seven siblings I have four brothers and three sisters and I'm the number six out of the family. So <clears throat> mom and dad, you know, did a great job raising us. And they wanted us to remain Catholic. And really that's the story of my life is, you know, holding on to that Catholic faith. Well, I worked for the airline. I lived close to the airport in Carter Lake, Iowa. And I went to Mass at uh, Sacred Heart Church up on Benny Street in Omaha. And the old Monsignor there, Monsignor Osdick, he wouldn't change. And so I, I didn't move away from there until 1966. So I didn't see any changes. I heard about them. Uh, we've both been in the traditional movement since 1976. So it's been quite a while now. Uh, I always find myself when I, I always curious interest when somebody does find the church for sure, because it is uh, everyone has a different story. But for me, I think I have to go back to when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, even though I was born in a, in a Catholic family, and at that time, the Latin tra traditional mass was everywhere in the world, all the Roman rites. And uh, one thing I remember is uh, even though I didn't feel I got a lot of instruction as a Catholic. I had certain senses in me that I always believed in God. And I remember as maybe five, six years old, we had we got a television and I would watch Bishop Sheen on TV and I could understand what he was saying. And I had a sense of a of, of great appreciation of truth when I was a little kid. Because I could sense it. I mean, maybe that's what got me at different times when someone would say something was wrong. I said, well, that doesn't make sense because I would have a sense of it. Truth has a... Uh, something definite in your mind that says that's got to be right. Uh, later, uh, there was also a couple things that always kept me too. Was uh, I had a member going to a Christmas midnight mass, and I would have such peace after mass. Uh, and uh, also, when I'd hear the litany being chanted or so, I, and also benediction, those things stayed with me as a little kid. That they were precious moments in my life. So I became an altar boy, probably between seven and nine. And uh, oddly enough, after that period of time, I don't remember really going to church anymore. Oh, well, I had nothing to do with my story. My <laughs> parents had everything to do with my story. I, I, I guess there's no such thing as luck. I was blessed to be born into a family with um, two converts. And um, they had both been fairly recent converts. My dad, I think, converted in the early 50s. From Protestantism. From Protestantism. They were um, Lutheran, I think. My mother was a Southern Baptist. My dad converted um, after, uh, he, I think he knew that the religion that he was in was not the correct religion and started to actively pursue the truth. And um, uh, my dad was a very studious man and he just started reading and um, exploring and by the grace of God found Catholicism. Um, he met and was blessed by Pope Pius XII in the mid 50s when his, uh, he was in the Navy and so his whole ship, um, all the Catholics, got to meet the Pope and were blessed by the Pope. And um, then my mother, her sister, had married 
a Catholic and converted to marry her husband, my mother went to the Catholic Church with, aunt, with my aunt, my Aunt Bunny, because um, in Protestants, you go for the fellowship. You don't go for the faith. And since she didn't know anybody in the local, you know, local Baptist church, she didn't go to the Baptist church. It was much more natural for her to um, go to the church that her sister went to. So she went with Aunt Bunny every Sunday because she had grown up a church-going girl. She was in the choir. She had grown up church-going. She couldn't imagine not going to some church on a Sunday. So she went with Aunt Bunny. And um, after a little bit, I think his name was Father Brown, um, noticed this cute little girl, unmarried girl, and knew that he had a church of unmarried boys. <laughs> and he, he kind of approached her and said, uh, you know, I, I, we've got this group that needs a little bit, I need a little help, I think working, uh, setting up the coffee pot or some excuse to get her more involved in the church. And so she, she started talking to him and it wasn't too long before, you know, she was converted. And here, I have to step back a second. My mother always said that the first time she ever walked into a Catholic church, she felt the difference. Uh, Bill Meese is my name. I, I was born in northwest Iowa. We had a little town, Granville, which was 100% uh, Catholic, you know, German and Irish. And uh, I grew up there on a farm, and uh, we tr went to the traditional mass. That's the only mass there was at that time. And uh, I got married in 19... Uh, 61. I met a, a, my wife in 1960. I can't be grateful enough to have been born of a Catholic family. My mother was an immigrant from I Italy. Uh, she immigrated here from, uh, I believe, uh, Solcedo, Italy, when she was four years old. Uh, Catholic, very much Catholic background. Uh, my father, uh, he was born in Chicago, but my grandparents, my father's parents, they were from Lithuania, very Catholic family. Yeah, well, my dad says, and he didn't tell the story to many people, that when he was on the road to conversion, he dreamt, when he was already studying the Catholic faith very seriously, he, um, he dreamt that our Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, um, yep, this is the one, <laughs> in so many words, this is where you need to be. And it was after that that he uh, formally adopted, you know, made, became a, a catechumen. From that point, I had various, various jobs, a sh shepherd receiver, and then I got a job at a steel factory on an assembly line. It's where he had sander tube, and there was a layoff, so I switched companies over to another steel factory on an assembly line again in London. And I was getting into a real rut, work, eat, sleep. Um, every, every guy I knew, all they wanted to do was drink. Anyway, I went to my mother and I asked her, how do you get a change in life and new friends? You know, I wanted something more out of life. Anyway, she said, well, we'll start a novena and I have a massive for a change in life. <clears throat> well, somewhere about midweek, someone suggested to me, why don't you go to, to college for photography? You always liked that as a hobby. Anyway, I thought, what a waste of time. You know, three years in school, I'm back in the, the assembly line. So I mentioned to my mother and she said, well, think about it. So I went to the church that Sunday, and I said a little prayer before Mass. I said, I've never asked for anything for myself before. I want to know at this Mass what I should do with my life. Personally, I think it was a pretty bold prayer to ask. The priest came out and never saw him before in my life. He started his sermon by saying, <clears throat> Father so-and-so has just got sick before Mass. So I don't have a sermon to prepare, so I'm just say one off the top of my head. So I want to talk about men who work in steel factories on assembly lines. You know how you kind of just work, eat, and sleep? Well, the first thing you have to realize is we're born in the image and likeness of God. And one of God's attributes is creativity. When you're on that line, you're creating a product and they're fulfilling your nature. If you become destructive, you'd be opposing your nature. But the benefit is it's an eight-hour job. When you finish, you go home and forget. But if you want to move into areas that are closer to God, move into photography. And it was a beautiful time to uh, grow up uh in the Catholic faith. Uh, I went to a, a, a parish school that had about a thousand kids. 
uh, from second grade to eighth grade. So I had Catholic education all my life. Um, as a family, we went to Mass every Sunday. During Lent, we go every day. Um, as a family, we practiced uh, going to confession weekly. It was a thing to go on Saturday. The whole family went for confession. Uh, when there was novenas or stations of the cross, we did those things as a family. Uh, prayed the family rosary, uh, wore the scapular. So I'm very blessed to have had some very good Catholic parents. And my dad was in the Navy, so they traveled. They went to Europe and they came home again. And many, many travels later, um, they, uh, when the changes started to happen, let's say the uh, 74, 75, something like that, we were all going to Catholic schools. And the strange things started happening in the Catholic schools. And uh, we would come home and tell stories. And um, they were, my, their ears were perking up that something was, was very much amiss already. Uh, pretty soon you couldn't use your prayer book because it did, you couldn't, couldn't follow. So they said, well, we got a solution to that problem. We're going to have a, a, a pamphlet, a missalette every month, a new missalette. So then and it kept changing and changing and changing. And like a little hole in the tire just kept tire going down, you know. So my mom and dad were attending the Novus Ordo, and there had been contention just building with difficulties in, you know, they were being taught things that were just, not right, heretical, not what Christ would have taught. And it just bothered my dad, you know, with much chagrin, he would go to church on Sundays. And I remember the battles my father used to have with the priest with regard to the changes. Uh, my brother was in a Catholic seminary, and my parents, after I believe it was like three years in a seminary, my parents, you know, counseled him to get out of the seminary because the things were changing very quickly. I moved to California in 1964. Our church was very traditional there, but it had brought in the, the, the new mass, the new Vatican II mass. And I, um, when I got to California, it was a different ballgame because it was very liberal out there. And we'd go from, uh, we lived in uh, Lakewood, California, and we'd travel all the different parishes around and try to find one that wasn't so liberal, you know. And, uh, we finally found one that we thought we could stomach, more or less, and we bought a house close by, and the kids went to school there, and, uh, uh, you know, we, they went to Catholic school all their life, and, and uh, which I thought was Catholic, but uh, they came home from school, and they said, the, the nuns said that uh, Adam and Eve was a myth, and I said, nah, you didn't, you're not paying attention, you didn't hear them right. The Bible is just a storybook, you know. Nah, you're not paying attention, so then. When I was in kindergarten, uh, in first and second grade, uh, we had nuns helping in first and, I should say kindergarten, first grade. I was in a public school because our Catholic school did not have a kindergarten or first grade, but we did go to CCD. Uh, and it's interesting because at that time, there were sisters who were very, very conservative, and there, was, there, was, there were sisters who were very progressive as well. Uh, but we did get, you know, the faith instilled in us. Uh, we moved up to Yellowneck, both those territories. And I was definitely not practicing my faith at that time. You get more and more involved in the world. Think, you know, you get more influenced by the world and different things happening. And I, I was 15 years old. I thought I was going to finish school there. And instead, circumstances happened and I had to start making a living on my own. Well, I found out everyone left me. But there was another moment in my life where I was coming into town and I had a, a, such a feeling in me that the world offered me nothing, and I wanted to get my faith back. I was probably, again, around 15, 16 years old. So that I, and at that point, I started to read the Book of Wisdom and St. John's Gospels. But I wasn't anywhere near where I should be yet. So I went back to church, and it has absolutely changed. Now they're on a table. I had to check a few times what church I was in, because I wasn't sure I was in a Catholic church. And I moved over to Iowa in 1966, the first time I went to a church in, uh, I believe it was Council Bluffs, Iowa, I went, walked in and I looked and I thought, what? Maybe I'm in the wrong place. Third grade I received my uh, first, I got confirmed in third grade. Uh, things were still very, very conservative back then. 
Fourth grade, things were great. In fifth grade, things began to change and very, change very quickly. Uh, the sisters, you know, uh, changed their habit, got a modified habit. Well, then we moved back to Iowa in 1975 and uh, went to the churches there, and the kids went to school there. <clears throat> and uh, my kids went through grade school, and then they were in high school. And every two, we went to Mass every Sunday. What we thought was Mass. Went to confession every, every two weeks for the kids. So one Lent, I said, we're going to say the rosary. So I got the rosaries around. I said to my son, start the Apostles' Creed. I, said, I don't know one. You live in the Catholic school your life, don't know the Apostles' Creed. No, my daughter. I don't know her. Didn't know the Apostles' Creed, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, Glory be or the, or, or the Act of Christian. As you're in high school and you don't know these prayers, how do you go to confession? One day the priest, when they had a thing in the, uh, in the bulletin of what to do before Mass, and I put a note, say the rosary, and the next Sunday he says, somebody wrote, say the rosary. He said, I'd rather go right to God. And, and I know the battles my father used to have. My father would... Uh, sometimes talk to the priest about, why don't you preach about the rosary or about Our Lady or something of this nature. And, you know, unfortunately, things were going more along the lines of social issues and political issues as well. Finally, the last Sunday that they attended Mass, it was actually All Saints Day, uh, I believe 1981. And he was at the sermon, listening to the sermon, and the priest from the pulpit said, we're all saints here. Everybody's a saint. And as soon as the so-called mass was over, the priest had his, his vestments off so quickly. He was out there all drinking coffees with the coffee on top of the table. And I'm thinking, this is like sacrilegious, and I don't even have my faith yet. We were in mass in Norfolk, Virginia, um, a Sunday morning. And my, the, the priest, it was, I don't think it was our normal priest. I think it was a visiting priest, but I'm not sure. Or... Well, there were about four priests in the parish, and it was one of them that stood up in the pulpit and it was wildly gesticulating. All of us children were like, <laughs> it was not normal. Um, and he said, and he, he gestured to our Lord on the crucifix, and he said, you don't have to worry about your sins. He died for your sins. I remember that. Uh, I think I go back to fourth grade. Uh, the priest... Uh, at the time came into our classroom to give a class instead of sister and he drew, he, he drew a big mountain on the board and he said this mountain represents life and the top of the mountain's heaven and uh, he said that we're going up the Catholic road but if you don't want to go up the Catholic road all religions basically go to this follow the same path to heaven. My dad you could feel the vibrations in the pew. <laughs> And uh, my wife was with me, and uh, we walked out that day, and I said, that's it, I'm done. And my dad tapped my mom, we're leaving. And they left. And that was the last time they went to the Novus Ordo. And my dad stood up, motioned to us children, right in the middle of the sermon, and all seven children, no, it would have been six children probably at that time, maybe five or six at that time, um, just followed, and we were like, what? <laughs> and I'll never forget the day... Uh, this priest gave a very liberal sermon, and right in the middle of the sermon, my father snapped his finger and said, we all got up, genuflected, and walked out. Followed my dad out the pew out and down the aisle. The priest stopped talking for a minute, and everybody in the church <laughs> watched us go. And uh, I'll never forget that, because the, the church was packed, and we were up in the front. And they had a priest that they knew there. He was an older priest by the name of Father Wall. And he was a good priest, and my dad said to him, <clears throat> um, you know, look at all the things that are going on. Look at all the, all the, these bad things that they're teaching us, they're showing us. These are not right. And he said, I know, but what do you want me to do about it? What's his answer? A day or two later, uh, I'd been home from school, and my father was working, doing something in the kitchen, putting up some wallpaper or something. Doorbell rang, and he said, go see who it is, and there was the pastor. And I went and said, uh, Father Madden's at the door. And my father said, well, 
tell him to apologize. I, I would come and get him, but I'm, I'm putting up this wallpaper. I can't, I, everything's wet right now. I gotta put it up right now. So I asked father, would you come in? My father's working in the kitchen. He can't come and greet you here. So my dad was very respectful. And Father Madden said, you know about Sunday? My dad said, I know about Sunday. Um, and so Father Madden said, well, that can't, that can't go on again. My father said, don't worry about it because we're going to go to another parish. We're done. By the grace of God, to this day, I do not know how he knew that Father Fenton, Father Francis Fenton, was in Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia, or Virginia Beach area, and was um, through the ORCM at the time, and was giving talks. So... We began attending a mass up in northern Chicago, uh, Father Leonard McNamara. He was an old priest, um, a very, very holy priest, and uh, he was allowed to have the Latin Mass. He was basically retired, I believe he was in his late 80s, and he would have Mass at the side altar of Our Lady. And I'll never forget uh, his custom when he go out for Mass was to uh, have a, 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 a flower to Our Lady. He'd go out and, you know, genuflect as best he could and put the flower on Our Lady's you know, feet, our lady's feet at the statue and then begin the Latin Mass. I worked for the airline and if there was a Mass in New York and I had the days off, I'd fly to New York to go to Mass. I've been in New Orleans two or three times, Arizona two or three times, Seattle, Spokane two or three times because now I knew why God gave me that job. So I knew I could get there, but I didn't know if I'd get back. But here I am. <clears throat> And uh, it's kind of interesting because we could basically tell who were the ones who really knew what was going on in the church and who were not. Because as, as Father Leonard McNamara was passing or distributing communion, a Novus Ordo priest, a modern priest, would come out and go into the, over the table, you know, the, the modern tabernacle, and he'd go to distribute communion, people would get up and walk away from him and go over to Father Leonard McNamara. So we knew those people know that the Novus Ordo is not a good mass. And we got to chat here and there along the way, and we realized we're both Catholics. And the first time we went out in this day, uh, day was at her father's house to, to attend the Latin traditional mass. So Father Norman, and it was his first time at Mr. Stever's house. And when, uh, when I got there, Father asked me, have you ever served the mass before? And I said, well, I was an altar boy when I was a kid, but you know, he said, well, I want you to serve. So it's a very important part of my life right there because when I was serving the mass, I'm sure my, alter, my uh, angel had to translate my Latin. But anyway, uh, in that Mass, I had a real serious impression that this Mass was serious, it was important, and people were trying to destroy it. And I thought that would be terrible. So I came back the next Sunday, I served Mass again. Now, a more serious impression affected my soul that time. And this was like our Lord talking to me, saying, If you attend this Mass, a priest will say it. But if you take the easy way out, I will say on your judgment day, I was counting on you and you let me down. We knew something was wrong in the church. We knew there was, there was elements there that were, were no good. Um, we looked for what was the most conservative parish we could find. And then uh, we were able to hear a lecture by, at the time, Brother Dennis Shacoin, and he explained and put everything together that uh, the changes in the church and whatever, uh, they were obviously uh, done to destroy the church, destroy the faith. Uh, and this tied in with Our Lady's uh, Third Secret of Fatima. So that night there was a lecture, and I didn't know I was going to get there on time, so I had my son go over and record it. To Francisco, Jacinta, and Lucia. And tonight we will be reviewing that simple message and also making reference to the prophecies made by our Blessed Mother if her message was not fulfilled. Well, then I got to the middle of the lecture. One of the priests was having, one of our, one of our priests had a lecture over there. And he said, tomorrow morning there's going to be a Mass at this one person's house. So if you come for Mass, you're welcome to come. So I went over there and went in and I walked in there and I said, Dan, what are you doing here? I've been here for five years. I didn't even know what was, what was going on. So then it went on like a light switch, you know. I, I, right away, I, I knew there was something wrong for a long time, but this put the cap on. I knew what was, what was going on, you know. In the November, I believe, of 1982 was when my, first, my dad first saw in the, in the newspaper 
they called it the Evening Post from Wellington. And my dad worked in Wellington, um, which is about an hour, maybe an hour and a half from Pierre Perrin. I lived there for a few months. Did you? Oh. Yeah, beautiful city. Yeah, it was, it was a little ways. The dad used to drive it, maybe less than an hour. I can't remember the time now, but um, yeah, he, uh, he was an insurance agent there. And he saw the advertisement for the Fatima conference, the CMRI, and that was being advertised in New Zealand. Interesting. And it was sort of a, you know, a random day. He said it was a, a Monday or a Tuesday evening that he, he decided to go to this Fatima conference and hear them talk about Fatima. And it was Father Dennis and the sisters. And um, he went there that evening and he listened. And <clears throat> I think he spoke to Father at the end. He really agreed with everything that he heard. And there was only one thing he said that Father, you can't convince me that the Pope is not the Pope. And Father said, okay, Mr. Gilchrist, um, why don't you go home tonight, think it over, come back tomorrow morning and come to Mass. And so that next morning he you know, decided, okay, I'll go to Mass. And during the Mass he, he just had this you know, grace, a moment of grace and inspiration. And he said, I think they're right. And from that point on, our family, you know, he jumped right in with his whole heart. What about the lecture? It was in the it was in the in the newspaper, and uh, it was talking about the message of Fatima. And then, in 1960, we were waiting for them to expose it because they were supposed to made it made it public. It never happened. So I, I just wanted waited and waited and waited, you know, for this to happen. So I uh, went to the lecture. Well, then the lights went on. You know, I, I knew what was going on then. You know. <clears throat> right. um, so he um, went to see Father Fenton speak, and figured it all out. I mean, it was this, obviously, we didn't, we never went back to that church again. And um, he found out through Father Fenton where there were little pods of people. And so for, I think maybe six months, uh, six to nine months, we would go every Sunday to a hotel room and pray the rosary with a group of people. We never saw a priest while we were there, but it was a group of maybe, it was not more than 15 people that just prayed the rosary together. And then mom and dad, when we would have coffee, and they would talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> My father called the newspaper to get the number for the CMRI. So he had to kind of go through, you know, a double, double thing there. Didn't have a number on the article, which it's a place. So he got the number. He called the number. They called back sometime in the evening and said, um, yes, Mr. Go, because we have uh, we are in Auckland right now, which is where people mostly fly internationally out of Auckland. So that was several hours north of where we were. He said, and we're due to fly out in the morning, father and the sisters. We're leaving, going back to America. Because this was November, they were all excited to get back for Christmas, to be back in the United States. <clears throat> well, everything got canceled, the flights got canceled. They changed their whole entire schedule, came back because of my dad and our family and held the conference. And Dad said there was about 60 people there at the conference, that, that last conference that they had. And no, circumstances happened. We, we only had a few masses at Mr. Stever's house. And then another fellow by the name of Mr. Albert Duden, they opened up a chapel in his house. And uh, probably just a, a few weeks later, we went into London at my mother's house. And it, to me, it was very special because we had a mass there a few times and my one sister had been away from faith for her whole, her whole life. And she was not well. She came back to attend the Mass, but received the sacraments, and she died. So it's like God saved her soul at the end. And I'm just amazed at that. We tried uh, a few different places, right? We went to uh, the YMCA, mm -hmm. YWCA, and we never really knew people didn't come, but we, we got a curiosity, people, things like that. We tried the holiday, and nothing changed. And uh, then we followed her. Uh, Norman didn't ask us to have mass at our house. In 79. In 1979. So at that time we had a one and a half story house, one, you know, one and three quarter story. So we just had a small bedroom. We started the mass there. And uh, Father kept the blessed sacrament there, I think it was. Yes, yeah. he did. So we kept the blessed yeah. sacrament there all the so time. So we made it every two weeks. <clears throat> came so back every two weeks. Uh, we just had one of the couple that came. Uh, and there was other people, another four, that said they would come, but they never came. I had built a, an altar, like a simple altar, and I had a couple of dealers. But the people didn't come, and I wasn't sure why. 
what's going on. So I thought, well, maybe I'm not providing the space. So I built two longer kneelers that would fit eight people, and eight people showed up. Father Dennis would come maybe uh, once, two, once every month, and once every six months, it all depended. But we had a chapel at Dave Torzon's house. I had the Blessed Sacrament there, we could go and pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And, of course, my wife and them didn't totally understand it, you know. Um, so my family, they, they were, uh, uh, they thought I wasn't crazy, you know. <clears throat> of course, you, I pushed and shoved and screamed and hollered, you know. I, I, you can't for, force them to come Catholic. They have to come on their own, and I, I pushed very hard. And they drug me off, had me deprogrammed, trying to change me, but Our Lady helped me persevere. <clears throat> so the one of the gentlemen that was coming to the Mass, he, he was uh, um, a, a builder himself. He made furniture, things like that. And while I'm getting the chapel ready, I had my simple altar there, and I built, made all these kneelers. He said, I want to show you my workshop. So I went up there with him. And he had a solid oak altar, communion rails, and the crew table. He said, that's a gift to the chapel. It was amazing. We put it in there, and we had uh, everything ready. And 33 people showed up for the first Mass. And I can't remember it was the feast. Uh, I think my wife can remember the date. I was born on remembering things like that. I think it was, um, I think it was Feast of Christ the King. And um, Father, Father Norman said the Mass, and he said he felt he was going to a bishop's chapel. And then, you know, we found out about um, the church in Denver, and um, actually in Aurora, Colorado, where Father Placid White was at the time. And he, um, my dad retired early, and because he, there was no school. At that time, homeschooling basically didn't exist. It cost him quite a bit, too. It was, a, it was a huge sacrifice, yeah. It was a sacrifice to retire when he retired. And it was also a sacrifice that um, he, we left with no job. My dad had a certain amount of money from his retirement, so we had that, but he left with no job, and we traveled cross-country. We stayed with my uncle, who was in Colorado for a short time, and then my dad kind of found a couple small jobs you know, to supplement his um, retirement. But in the meantime, there was a school so we went to the school in Aurora at Our Lady of Victory. It's interesting, maybe it was the most, you know, the most they had, but um, at a conference and it was all because, you know, dad said, stay, can you stay? My mom and dad knew that our kids, we were at stake. Our family was at stake, so, so they just picked up and moved us. And then we're not the only ones. I've heard a lot of stories just like this of parents that did this at right about that time. It took a lot of courage for my father to, to have us all walk out of the church right in the middle of Mass and, uh, and then to confront the pastor of the, of the parish there. St. Augustine says that to fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek Him is the greatest adventure and to find Him is the greatest human achievement. May God reward those brave pioneers of the Catholic faith who never stopped loving, who never stopped seeking, who never stopped fighting for God and his Catholic Church, and whose legacies will live into eternity.